Everybody grows up with the dream and hope of being financially successful. And for a lot of people, that means hitting that six figure mark, making a hundred thousand dollars. Before we get into how you can actually make a hundred thousand dollars, let's clarify what a hundred thousand dollars means because there's a difference between making a hundred thousand dollars and making a hundred thousand dollars a year. I mean, if you have ten thousand dollars and you put it in the stock market and you get a little lucky and the stock that you invest in rallies, that ten thousand dollars could turn into a hundred and ten thousand dollars. And now if you sell that stock, you made a hundred thousand dollar profit. Another example of this is you go into your gas station, you buy a Powerball ticket and you get lucky and you win a hundred thousand dollars. Or your great uncle John dies with no kids and he really liked you. And so he leaves you with a hundred thousand dollar inheritance. In all of these examples, you made a hundred thousand dollars one time and then you go out and you buy yourself a nice car, you buy a nice watch, you go on a vacation, and then three months later, after making $100,000, you are left with zero dollars. That's why in this video, I'm gonna be focusing here, how you can make $100,000 a year, but there's also a difference between making $100,000 a year gross and making $100,000 a year net. If you go out and you work a job and you get a salary paying you $100,000 a year, that is $100,000 gross. But the government doesn't let you keep all of that money, right? The IRS wants their share, they want their taxes. And so if you make $100,000 a year, and let's assume you don't live in New York or California, the very high tax states, you are going to be left with right around $70,000 after paying your federal taxes, your social security taxes, your Medicare taxes, and your state income taxes. After you make $100,000 gross, you'll be left with $70,000. That's why if you want to keep $100,000, you need to make $100,000 net after taxes. So again, assuming you don't live in California or New York, one of those really high tax states, you will need to make about $140,000 before taxes from your job in order to make $100,000, wait, this one right here, $100,000 net. So if you wanna keep $100,000, you need to make $140,000 before taxes from your job. And if you just wanna make $100,000, then you can expect to make $70,000 after taxes. By the way, if you've ever heard people say it's not how much money you make that matters, it's how much money you keep, well, this is one of those reasons why, because everybody talks about making $100,000 a year, but just because you make $100,000 a year doesn't mean you get to keep $100,000 a year. Same with here. Just because you make $140,000 a year doesn't mean you get to keep all $140,000. The easiest way to achieve a goal is to break it down into bite-sized pieces. That way you understand exactly what you have to do in order to achieve that goal. So if your goal first is to make $100,000, this is $100,000 gross before taxes, that means that you have to make $274 a day seven days a week, 365 days a year. So you have to make $274, including weekends, including holidays, every single day on average in order to make $100,000. For some of you, you might be like, okay, well, how does that break down if I'm working five days a week and I take off three weeks a year for holidays? If that's the case, then you need to make $410 a day, five days a week, assuming you get three weeks off a year. So you're not working Saturdays and Sundays and you get three weeks off a year, then you have to make $410 per working day. And if you do that, you will make $100,000 in a year gross before paying any taxes. So you will make $100,000. If your goal is to keep $100,000, then the numbers are a little bit different. If you're talking about making money seven days a week, then you need to make $383 a day. And if we're talking about making money five days a week with three weeks off a year, then you need to make $571 a day for each of those working days in order to keep $100,000. At first glance, these numbers might seem unreasonable and you might be thinking, man, there's no way I'm gonna ever be able to make $100,000 or keep $100,000, but that's not the case. This is where financial education comes in handy because there's so many other ways to earn money where it's not just you physically working to make money at your job. There are other things that you can do and I'm gonna be talking about them in this video, but this is where understanding money is so helpful because you know what? There's a lot of money in the world. Like 1,700 people become millionaires every single day. That means there's a lot of people that are earning more wealth 
every single day because they understand how money works. And that's exactly what you need to understand. You need to first understand how money works and then create a system and a plan on how you are going to earn the money you need in order to make that six figure income. The thing that holds so many people back from ever achieving more financial success is not how hard you work or where you work or your degree or where you grew up or your ethnicity or your race. It's your mindset and your limiting beliefs. Because if you tell yourself that you can't do this, you are not going to be able to. You have already shut yourself down and it is not going to be possible for you to make $100,000 no matter what because you've already told yourself no. There's a lot of people that make $100,000 a year, but there's also some people that make $100,000 a month and some people make $100,000 a week and some people make $100,000 a day and there are some people that make $100,000 an hour. Now, it's very hard for our minds to comprehend these type of numbers, but this is the reality. There's a lot of money in the world. And so what you need to do first is stop giving yourself these limiting beliefs that you cannot do something and understand how you can do it. The person who's earning $100,000 a month isn't working 12 times harder than somebody making $100,000 a year. It's just not possible. What the difference is, is the amount of value you provide. For example, if this video is providing you with any value, I would appreciate it if you would reward me with that thumbs up button below because the way the YouTube algorithm works, if you do not smash that thumbs up button, then YouTube is much less likely to show you and other people our financial news and education videos. The reason why a cashier at McDonald's makes minimum wage while LeBron James earns millions and millions and millions of dollars a year is not because of how hard they work. I mean, they both work hard. The cashier has to work hard. Have you ever worked a minimum wage job before? It is very hard. The difference is how much value you provide. There are seven and a half billion people in the world that can take over the cashier position. That's why you are easily disposable. And because of that, you are going to be paid accordingly. Now, I'm not trying to say that as a human or that as a person that you don't have value. That is not what I'm trying to say. In the market, in the economy, you are easily dispensable because there are a lot of people that can do the exact same job versus LeBron James. There's very few people like LeBron James, and because of that, he can make a whole lot more money. So if your goal really is to make more money, then you have to think beyond just working harder. You need to think how you can make more value, because if you can provide more value, you will naturally earn more money. There are five ways that you can create more value and hit that six figure mark, or even a whole lot more, depending on what your goals are and how much effort you're willing to put in. And these are things that you can do, whether you're working a job or you wanna start a business or you wanna do a side hustle. So let's go over these five things. One is job growth. Two is investing in your career. Three is investing your money. Fourth is creating external value. And number five is starting your own business. I'm going to be going over these five things, starting with growth in your job. The most accessible way to do this is by growing in your job. And you can get this type of job growth, whether you're in a very small company or in a big company. If you are in a big company, you want to make sure you have the room for advancement, the room to grow. So maybe you start off as an associate, then you become a manager, then a director, then a vice president, and then maybe a corporate executive. So if you are going up the ranks and you keep working hard at your job, then you are going to create more value at your job because now you have a lot more insider information and in how to run the company. You know how to build the brand and you create a lot more value at your position. And when you create more value, you are naturally going to increase your income. And that's how you can hit that six figure salary because now you're providing more value at your company because they don't want to lose you because you have built that tenure and you have built that reputation and you know how the company works. So the company doesn't want to lose you. And once you do that, they will be willing to to pay you a whole lot more. If you're working at a smaller company, you might not see that clear corporate ladder, but what you will have is the opportunity to grow with a company. You see this all the time with startups. If you're working at a startup that's growing, chances are you're gonna see your salary grow or you're gonna get revenue share or bonuses that grow with the company. And very quickly as the company is growing, you can see your income increase. And if you are part of a growing company, then you have a lot of kind of value in that company because you have helped build that company. And if you help build a company, you are going to see your income grow with the company as long as the company is growing with you. The third alternative to getting this type of salary and job growth is working in sales because in sales, it's really effort in, money out. If you can master the sales process and you have a good product and you practice your craft, you can get to that six figure salary as a salesperson. I know quite a few seven figure sales people because they know how to sell, they know what they're doing and they have built a lot of trust with their clients. And so now they can make a great income because they know how to sell and they have built that growth through their efforts. The value that they provide is that they have put in all the time and the effort and the money learning how to sell the right way and they have perfected their craft. This isn't 
isn't something that happens overnight, but it is possible for somebody who wants it. Second, you can invest in your profession to increase your salary. So let me give you kind of a more personal example because I'm an attorney. If you are a paralegal, so paralegals are people that work with attorneys, you might be making $40,000, $45,000 a year. But if you invest in your education and you go become an attorney and you invest that time into learning, well now as an attorney, you can make $140,000 a year just because you invested in your profession. You invested in your education with money and time. And if you do that, now you can increase your salary. The reason this happens again is not how hard you worked, but because of how much value that you can provide. Both paralegals and attorneys both work hard, but not as many people are going to invest that time or that money going through law school, getting their law degree, that way they can actually work as an attorney versus becoming a paralegal. You don't have to run through all those hoops. The reason this is becoming a little bit more important now is because back in the day, having a college degree was a big deal because not a lot of people had college degrees. Nowadays, having a college degree is almost like baseline. That is like standard. So if you want to stick out, you need more of a professional degree or a higher level degree, which costs more money. It takes more time, but this is the reality of the society that we're in. If you want to work a job and you want to earn a higher salary, you need to be able to separate yourself from the rest of the crowd. One way to do this is to get a higher degree, maybe a law degree or an MBA or a medical degree, whatever it is, something that can help you define a higher salary. Another way to do this is to invest in your profession through something outside of the traditional education system. Maybe that means getting certified or getting some other continuing education. Something that you can show people where you have more value that you can provide now because you have the certain education that a lot of other people don't. The second option works great for a lot of people because you don't need to invest as much money as you would if you wanted to get an MBA or a JD and you don't have to invest that much time. You can do this on the side. For example, you can go online and get a certificate in understanding data science, and now you can make a six-figure salary because you have the certificate, and you didn't have to go back to school in order to do that, and you didn't have to pay a school's tuition. What an employer looks for, and I'll tell you from personal experience, is people that are good at doing specific tasks. If you can show your boss or an employer that you are very valuable because you're very good at doing something, you're gonna be able to make a whole lot more money. The reason that people who graduate school with general degrees, like a general psychology degree, I can say this because I graduated college with a general psychology degree, struggle getting a good job is because it's very hard for an employer to understand what your skill set is. What is it that you're good at? Where can you provide the most value? If you don't know or cannot show where you can provide this value, then you're going to be compensated accordingly. That's why if you can get one of these certificates or get a higher degree or invest in your profession, that way you can demonstrate that you're good at something and have experience in something, you are going to be able to make more money. Third, let's talk about investing your money. That way you can hit that six figure mark. So number three and number four are going to be supplemental to one and two. That means you can do these things in addition to one and two to help you hit that six figure mark because you can supplement your salary with number three and number four. When you invest your money, so this is typically we're talking about stock market investing or real estate investing. When you invest your money, you are putting your money to work. And the good thing about this is your money doesn't need sleep, it doesn't need rest, it doesn't need to go to the bathroom, and it doesn't need vacations. Your money can work and earn your money seven days a week, 365 days a year, and it doesn't need a break. The thing that you have to understand about investing your money is you need to have realistic expectations of the type of returns you're gonna get with your money, because if you don't, then you're gonna be lured into risky investments and get rich quick schemes and things that just lose you money. If we're talking a completely passive investment, right now all you're doing is you are throwing your money into an investment, whether it's stocks or real estate, then a good return based off of your money investment, not your time, just your money, is something like a 7% annual return. So if you invest $100, expect to make $7 back a year. This doesn't mean that you have to make 7% every single year on your money. This means on average, over the long term, you are making 7%. Some years are going to be more, some years are less, but on average, it's 7%. So if your goal is to make $100,000 a year, based off of the 7% return, then you have to invest $1.4 million. And then if you do that, you will be able to make $100,000 a year. That's why this is something you need to do to supplement your income, because this is something that's gonna take time to build. Because if you consistently keep investing your money every single month, you are going to build a nest egg that is earning you money and that is supplementing your income. That way you can get to the six figure mark. Maybe your goal is to start off by just making an extra $100 a month. Once you can do that, then you can up that goal to how do you make $1,000 a month. 
and then $2,000 a month. It's all baby steps. I already made a video where I talked about how you can start earning passive income with a $1,000 investment. So if you want to watch that video, I will link it for you in the description below. There's two things that I want you to understand about these type of money investments. One is how do you get a better return? And two, the taxes that you pay, how much money you actually keep on this money. Let me start with the taxes part because I'm weird and I like talking about taxes, but I'll keep it simple and brief. When you invest your money, the government gives you a tax break because they say, okay, this money that you earn from your job, you already paid taxes on this money. So now when you invest this money that you earn, you should be able to get a tax break when this money makes you money. The only caveat here is you have to hold your investment for longer than a year, but if you make money from your investments and you hold your investments for longer than a year, then you get to pay much lower tax rates. That's why rich people and wealthy people put all their emphasis here. They want to know how they can make more money from their investments because when you make money from your investments, you get to keep more of your money because you don't have to pay as much money in taxes legally. So the good thing about this is this is something you can do completely passively. You just throw your money into your investments and you get to pay less money in taxes, which means you get to keep more of your money that you make because you've already paid taxes on the money that you earn from your job. So now when you're making money from your investments, you get lower tax rates because the government wants to incentivize you to invest your money and build your wealth. Second, if you want to get a better return on your money investments, well, then what you can do is invest more of your time. So now what you can do is look out for other business investments or look out for other real estate investments where you have to invest more time. Maybe you find a beat up property that needs more work. Now you have to invest your time and your money and so you can get a better return on your money or you can find a business that needs help. If you have some expertise that you can help this business with, now you can get a much better return on your money because now you're investing your money, you get some ownership in the business and then you can help this business turn around, make more money and as they do that, you will get a better return on your money, okay? The 7% number is a completely passive investment. You're throwing your money in the stock market or real estate and you are just trying to get a passive return. If you wanna be more active with your investments, then you can get a better return, but now this requires your money and your time. Fourth, let's talk about external value. How can you create value outside of the job that you're working at right now? That way you can attract more money. Well, one way that you can do this is by working a second job. If you work a second job, now you have two different jobs, two different incomes, and if they're both paying you $50,000 a year, now you have just hit that six-figure annual income mark, but now you have to be working 15-hour days. If you love what you do, then it's no big deal. But another thing that you can consider is potentially starting a side hustle. The side hustle is something that you're doing outside of your job, that you're doing on your free time and on weekends to help you supplement your income by doing something that you're good at. So you like this thing, you are good at something, and you create value out of it, and now your goal is to make money through this value that you have created. Before I really buckled down and learned how to build a business, I was a true side hustler. These are things that I thought were businesses, but they really were just side hustles. I used to work at weddings, I used to have an event planning business. I used to have an Amazon side hustle. I used to do real estate wholesaling. These are all things that I did that I thought were businesses, but they were really just side hustles. When you're working to create a side hustle, what you want to find is where can you provide unique value to the world? What is something that you can do that a lot of people cannot do? So when I used to work at weddings, what I did was play a drum called the dole at Indian weddings. So kind of niche because not a lot of people knew how to play their dole around me. And a lot of Indian weddings had the need for a dole player like me. And so when I got good at it, I was charging people like $250, $300 for 30 minutes to an hour's worth of me playing. So I was making pretty good money, especially as a 20 year old college kid playing the dole. But what you weren't paying me for was my time. You were not paying me for 30 minutes of work or an hour's worth of work. You were paying me for my years of experience and for my knowledge on how to play a dole. It took me a long time to learn how to play it and I had this value which is why I could charge a lot of money for a very short amount of time. Nowadays because of the internet it is so much more accessible to create a side hustle because you can do it on your laptop, you can do it on your phone, you can do it on your own time and you can do it from anywhere in the world. If you have a certain skill or knowledge that you want to give to the world well then you can create a class on Udemy and let people buy it. If you have certain skills that you want to help other businesses with, like maybe you're a good writer or you're a good coder or you're a good developer, or maybe you are really good at building financial spreadsheets, you can go to a freelance platform like Fiverr or Upwork or one of these places and you can market your services. Now people and businesses that need your help can hire you and you can do the work on your own time, you can set your prices and now you've just created a new side hustle without leaving your house. There is an unlimited amount of possibility here. If you have something that you like, something that you can provide value in, I can pretty much guarantee that you can find a way to monetize it. 
I mean, there are even side hustles for people to go and sleep and test out beds. So if you have something that you like and you like doing, there's a way that you can monetize it. And if you do want to learn more about how you can create other side hustles, our team put together an awesome article on 113 ways that you can create a side hustle and earn extra money. If you want to read the article, you can do it on our website, theminoritymindset.com, and I'll also link it for you up here and in the description below. What you're doing now is creating external value outside of your job. That way you can attract more money. That way you can hit or break the six-figure annual income. And finally, number five, you can start a business to build that six-figure income. So this can start off as your side hustle, and if it grows and evolves and it develops and you make more money from your side hustle than you do your job, that side hustle can become your business because then you can quit your job and put all of your effort into your side hustle and help grow that into a real business. But let me give you a word of caution. Starting a business is not easy. I don't care what kind of business you're trying to start, it is not easy easy to build a business. I'm not saying this to scare you, I just want you to understand because there's a lot of, let's call it crap on the internet of people promoting this whole idea that you can start a business with 40 minutes a day and then you can make six figures doing almost nothing. It does not work like that. If you want to build a successful business, you have to be obsessed and that means you are going to be working six, seven days a week, every single week and you're also going to have your business on your mind during holidays, during weekends, during nights, so your business is going to be on your mind all the time. So if you want to build a business, you have to understand that you have to have the entrepreneurial bug. It is not for everybody, but if it is for you, if you love the idea of building your own business and being your own boss, then by all means, go for it. When it comes to building a business, you need to understand the numbers. So let's say you start a business where you sell mugs. So this kind of looks like a mug. And let's say that each mug you sell for $10. Now, if you sell this mug for $10, you also have a cost. You have a cost to make the mug and to package the mug and ship the mug. Let's say after all of your expenses, which cost you, let's say $4, you are left with $6 of profit. So if you want to hit that six figure salary, you need to first multiply this out. If you're making $6 a mug, that means you have to sell about 17,000 mugs over the course of the year in order to hit that six figure profit. And in order to sell 17,000 mugs over a year, that means you have to sell about 46 mugs a day in order to hit that 17,000 mugs a year, which is about $100,000 in profit. At this point, what a lot of people think is, okay, if I wanna sell 46 mugs a day, good thing my store is online because my store is open 24 hours a day then, that means I need to sell something like two mugs an hour. If I need to sell two mugs an hour, how much money do I need to spend on advertising to sell two mugs an hour? If I'm running advertisements and it costs me $4 to get a customer, then yeah, my margins come down, but I can hit that 46 mugs a day, but then I'm gonna have to sell more mugs in order to hit that profit. But if I can run advertisements and spend $4 per customer to get a sale, well then all I gotta do is just scale that up. In theory, yeah, it works and it all sounds easy, but in reality, it's not so simple. So let's assume for the sake of this example that you made $100 thousand dollars in profit after selling mugs. So you sold a bunch of mugs and you still have a hundred thousand dollars in your bank account. One thing that you have to do now is decide are you gonna pay yourself a salary? If so, how much? So let's say you pay yourself a forty thousand dollar salary which leaves you with sixty thousand dollars in the bank account. Now you might be thinking, well, this profit is yours because you own the business, you run the business, so you can take the $60,000 and put it in your bank account because you have $100,000 of profit. But you have to remember, if you're building a business, you wanna have money to invest in your business and you wanna have money to help kind of protect your business in case of an emergency. And so if you want to grow the business, it would be better for you to take the $60,000 and actually invest it back into the business. Maybe you hire an employee, maybe you create a new mug line. You wanna do something where this is gonna help you earn more money. And so this is where you have to really understand the dynamics of a business because every dollar you pull out is a dollar that you cannot use to grow the business. So you have to understand that it's not as easy as just having $100,000 in your bank account to earn $100,000. But on the flip side, 
there's no limit to how much money you can make if you start a business because there's no limit to how many mugs you can sell. You can sell 46 mugs a day, you can sell 460 mugs a day, you can sell 4,600 mugs a day. So there's no limit and it really comes down to how big you wanna grow your business and how much effort you're willing to put in and how good your product is. We are living in an economy where having a side gig, a side hustle, or a side business is more important than ever. For 80% of Americans, you will need some sort of second stream of income, that way you can afford your lifestyle. Style. Now for the majority of people, this is bad news. Oh my God, I have to go out and find more work. But if you have that minority mindset, this can be a great opportunity for you to really just pad on your income and do something that you love that can provide you with a whole lot more freedom in the future if you know what you're doing. Back in the day, you had households with just one working person. You had the man that went to work and then you had the woman that stayed at home who did not work. Now, that was just how society functioned at the time. That was how the economy worked. But if we look at this just from a financial perspective, that one income allowed people and families to be able to afford life and groceries and vacations and buy a home. Nowadays, it's two income households. You have the man, the woman, or whatever the partnership is, however the household dynamics are, you have two people that are working to support their household. Now, even with these two people, people are still struggling financially. You would think that now people are making double the money, so it'd be much easier for people to go out and build wealth and become successful financially, but that's not the case. People are broker than ever now because we're seeing the cost of living around us go up very fast thanks to inflation, and we're also seeing our standard of living grow very quickly because a couple of decades ago, there was no such thing as an iPhone or a smartwatch or Lululemon leggings. And so we've seen the growth of technology. So we want more things, we want nicer things, which also means that now we need more money in order to be able to survive. The next generation is going to be, not only are you gonna have two incomes, but you're also gonna have a side gig or a side hustle. This is where you wanna get educated and get on top of this curve right now, that we can start earning more money, that we have more money to invest, that we have more money to build wealth, and that we have more money to have your financial freedom. And this is so important now, because now we're also going through this great resignation. We're going through a major change in our work system and our environment. So you need to understand what's going on, that way you can capitalize on the system and what's going on around us. That's why today I wanna to talk about how and why the economy is shifting. Then I I want to talk about some of the different ways that you can earn money and then I want to talk about the things that you need to know about what's coming in the future. When the pandemic hit, you had a few things happen. You had some people who were now able to work from home and they were making the same amount of money as before or more money because now these companies started making more money, they started giving bigger bonuses to their employees and they might have gotten stimulus checks on top of that. And then you had some people that were not able to work from home. They had to continue working their jobs, even if it was a minimum wage job, and they didn't really get any sort of hazard pay from their company, uh, but they did get some stimulus checks from the government, but still, they were still making money just from their jobs, but they had to go to work every single day, and they also had the potential risk of getting sick. And then you had the people that didn't have to work from home because now their companies just shut down. And so now they were getting unemployment checks and they were getting stimulus checks. And in some instances, these people that were sitting at home playing video games all day were making more money than the people that were going to work every single day to get paid. This started to frustrate a lot of people because people go to work to get paid. Now, obviously you should enjoy what you do. You should love what you do. But if you don't do what you do to get paid, then you should just ask your boss not to pay you. So people were getting frustrated because now they're either working or not working and the imbalance in the economic system wasn't making sense to a lot of people so people started to rethink what is important to them how should they get paid and what do they want to do then as more and more people were able to work from home they started to realize that hey i'm more productive when i'm working from home and i can do more things that i like and i can go to the gym when i want and i can get my car taken care of when i want and i can spend more time with my kids when i want so people were now starting to realize that I like this flexibility of being able to work from home because when I'm in the office, I'm just working on the computer anyways. So why do I need to be sitting at a designated desk for eight hours a day when I can just work from home and kind of work throughout the day? People who are working from home are working longer hours because now they're working from morning to night but they're working on their own schedule. And that's when some companies started to say, all right, now you need to come back into the office again like normal. Now, some people started to get irritated. They said, why do I need to go back into the office again when I was working just fine from home? In fact, I was being more productive from home. I was doing more work from home and I was able to do a whole lot more things on my day because now I don't gotta sit in traffic and I don't gotta commute. So why do you need me to come into the office? 
And this created the next shift in the economy, which was the Great Resignation. We were already facing a massive labor shortage across the country, where you have tons of companies that are looking for work, they're looking for employees, but you have a lot of people that are not working. And then you started to see the biggest voluntary exodus of people who were leaving their jobs voluntarily. They weren't leaving their jobs because they weren't getting paid well. They were leaving their jobs because they didn't like the way they were treated at their jobs. They didn't like their lifestyle because now for the first time, people started to look at their jobs not just as a paycheck, but as something to complement their lifestyle and their lives. Because now when people are looking for a job, they're not just looking for how much money am I going to get paid? They're looking for how much value am I going to get out of this job? Am I going to be happy here? Does the job align with my lifestyle? Meaning, can I work from home or do I have to work from the office? Does it align with my morals and regarding masks and vaccines? And is this job something that I want to do? And then they look at your pay. So people are looking at jobs very differently now than they did before. And so people are starting to quit because they're realizing that the job that they have doesn't fit their values. Now, on an economic level, this is creating a whole bunch of issues in the economy because companies are struggling to find work, they're struggling to find labor, they're struggling to grow, they're having to pay more money to employees, which is good for employees, bad for the company because now they're not making as big of profits. And so it's creating a very weird shift in the economy and we are going to see some of these old dinosaur type companies die because they're not willing to get with the times. But it's great for employees, it's great for people because now for the first time, you have the upper hand. You can now go look for jobs and you can find something that better fits your lifestyle and companies are fighting for employees. They're fighting for people. They're fighting with better pay. They're fighting with a better lifestyle. They're fighting with better benefits. So this is good news for employees. And that's exactly what we did here at the Minority Mindset. As soon as this pandemic hit, we started to follow the Dropbox model. Dropbox was one of the first tech companies to create something called the virtual first model, which means that, hey, you don't have a designated desk anymore. You can come into the office when you want, or you can work from home, you can work from the beach. All you have to do is make sure that you're getting the work done. Don't miss the meetings, don't miss the deadlines. So on the employment level, we are seeing a major shift through this great resignation where you have a lot of people voluntarily leaving their jobs, and this is creating a big gap in the employment marketplace. Then on the inflationary side, you have the cost of living going up very fast. You have the Federal Reserve Bank and the government still printing money. They're still trying to create more inflation because that's the only way that the United States government is going to be able to afford their $29 trillion worth of national debt because when you see more inflation, that means that the value of the dollar goes down so the United States government can then pay back the $29 trillion of national debt with cheaper dollars. So the government and the Fed want to create more inflation which is hurting the average person because now the price of things keep going up. So you have this higher cost of living and now if you go to work a job, one job isn't enough. Two jobs aren't enough. What people need now is they need their jobs and then they need some sort of additional supplemental income in order to be able to survive in this economy. Luckily, we live in this technology age where it is more accessible than ever to get some sort of side hustle or side gig where you can work some additional hours whenever you want and earn some extra cash. You can drive for Uber or you can drive for Lyft or you can deliver food through Grubhub or Uber Eats or you can deliver groceries through Amazon Fresh or Instacart. Or if you want to be a little bit more involved, you can create your own side hustle. It's kind of like creating your own small business, but now you can be a freelancer and you can help other businesses earn more money. You can help other businesses with their business and you can do this from your own home on your own schedule by being a freelancer. So if you go to a site like Fiverr or Upwork, what you can do is you can post your skills. Let's say you're good at writing, or you're good at graphic design, or you're good at video editing, or you have a cool voice and you can be a voiceover artist, or you're really good with accounting and you can help businesses manage their money better, manage their cash flow better. You can post these skills on these websites. Then, as a business needs more work, instead of hiring an employee, they can hire a freelancer like you. They can go onto these websites and say that we are looking for somebody to help us with our writing. And now if you post your skills and a business posts their advertisement to find some sort of writer, well now you two can meet. You can apply for the business a job or the business can find you and now you can provide your writing services for the business and the business will pay you for your writing service. The business is not going to tell you where to work. They're not going to tell you what hours you need to work. I mean, they might, depending on what the job is. But in general, they're not going to tell you that you have to be on the computer from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. In some occasions, you will see that. But in most occasions, you will not. 
what the business will do is they're going to tell you what they want, how long of an article they want, and what they want the article to be about, and they'll tell you what they're willing to pay you. And if this is acceptable to you, you can accept it, and now you just have a new side gig that you can work on on weekends or in evenings or whenever you want, and now you can do this work and earn some extra cash because of it. And depending on how entrepreneurial minded you are, this can lead to a whole lot more opportunities because now not only can you start doing this writing work for other businesses, but you could potentially create your own agency where now you have other writers that work under you. And so when people come to you for writing work, you can designate this not just to yourself, but to other writers. And so now you start to build your own business. But again, this takes a lot more work and now you need to really have the entrepreneurial mind to build this sort of agency. Or if you are even more entrepreneurial minded, then you can look at starting your own business or you can look at creating content in today's economy. Let me start by talking about content because this is one of the things that is very easy to understand. Like people understand that if you build a big YouTube channel, you can make a lot of money. Now, it is very hard to build a YouTube channel. You have a lot of competition. But the thing that's interesting now is you also have the growth of shorter videos, things like TikTok and Instagram Reels, which has just created a brand new industry, a whole new opportunity for people to create content. I was at a financial conference in Austin not too long ago. And when I was there, I met so many young TikTokers between the ages of 19 and 28 years old who were making tens of thousands of dollars a month. So somewhere between 20,000 and 50, 60,000 dollars a month through their TikTok page. And some of them hadn't even been on TikTok for a year. These are people that understood that a lot of people were moving to TikTok quickly. So they got onto TikTok, they started to understand the TikTok trends and they started to make viral videos. And then they started reaching out to companies to sponsor the videos. And now they're making a lot of money on TikTok by making these videos. Now, obviously, you want to now take this money and scale it into a real business because you don't want to just rely on the TikTok algorithm because if the algorithm turns off or something kind of fades away, well, now you're screwed because now you went from earning 20, 30, 40, $50,000 a month to zero. You never want to be in that situation. So you want to be smart. And if you were in that position where you're making that money, you want to reinvest it and to build a real sustainable business. But there are so many ways for you to create content, whether it's TikTok or YouTube or podcasts or Instagram or your blog. There are so many ways for you to create content and then you can build an audience online. And once you build an audience, there are so many different ways that you can monetize that way you can build a brand. Now, again, this doesn't mean that you have to be a content creator. Not everybody has it in them to be a content creator. But if this is something that you're interested in, it is an opportunity now that is accessible to anybody. You can start a YouTube channel with less than $100. I started the Minority Mindset YouTube channel with less than $100. I started making videos off of my phone with a tripod that I bought off of Amazon for 20 bucks. I bought a $25 light and that was it. And now our YouTube channel has over a million subscribers and we have transformed our YouTube channel into a full financial education and media company. And we are one of the fastest growing financial education and media companies on the internet. You saw a similar boom in the cryptocurrency market. There are so many newfound millionaires in the cryptocurrency market because cryptocurrency was one of the biggest redistributions of wealth ever because you had so many people that got onto it who were losing trust with the Federal Reserve Bank and the government. So they started buying cryptocurrency and then more and more people started to adopt cryptocurrency and then they were able to ride up the wave and build a lot of wealth because of it. There's still a lot of opportunity in the cryptocurrency market, but you just don't want to be one of the people that's trying to chase the hype, that's trying to get rich quick. You want to be one of the people that's educated and then make smart decisions based off of your now education. Or if you have an itch to create a product, well, now you can create your own product and you can sell it on the internet. The internet has made selling your product and marketing your product more accessible than ever because the internet is really just a place where people hang out digitally. Before, if you created a product, it took a long time to create a product and you had to go through all the efforts of creating a product. And once you did, then you had to open up a store. And then people had to come to your store and then hopefully people would like your product. So the success of your business depended on either where your store was located or what stores your product was in. And it's not always easy to get your product into a store, even if you have a good product. Nowadays, it's much more accessible because you can market your own product on your own e-commerce store. You can sell it on Amazon. And so you have the accessibility of showing your product to the world. Does that mean it's easy? No. It is very hard because now it's accessible to everybody, but it is accessible. And if you're willing to put in the work, now you can create your own product and then you can market it on the internet. And you don't even have to worry about trying to get it into stores. You can start selling immediately. You just have to understand marketing. The number one skill you need in order to make money on the internet is marketing. Now, when most people hear marketing, they think of the traditional marketing of how do I purchase TV advertisements and commercials? That is not what marketing means. 
Marketing means how do you get your product seen in front of people? And this doesn't just have to be a product, it's your brand. How do you get your product seen in front of people? You have the organic marketing and you have the paid marketing. There is such a big gap between what people think marketing is and what marketing really is on the internet. And if you want to be able to make money on the internet, you have to be able to market because all marketing is, is getting eyeballs on your brand or your product. So if you know how to get eyeballs on your brand or product, you will be able to make money on the internet. And if you can be very good at it, there's no limit to how much money you can make because now you can sell your own product, people can pay you for your marketing services, you can sell other people's products. I mean, there is an infinite amount of money in this space because if you know how to market your products, if you know how to get eyeballs on the internet, well now you have people's attention and everybody will be willing to pay you to understand how to market their brands. The economy is shifting and the pandemic helped us shift into this digital world even faster than ever. And so what you need to do is you need to understand this and you want to be able to capitalize on this shift. That way you can get a piece of the upside because it is more important than ever due to the higher inflation and the higher standard of living. And you don't want to be one of the people that's not going into debt to afford these nice things. You want to be able to afford these things, which means you're going to need to earn more money. And one of the most accessible ways to do that is by understanding how to earn some more money on the internet. Most people assume that successful people have to either ignore all the fun things that life has to offer or that you got lucky. But that's not the case. If you want to become successful, there are seven things that every successful person tries to avoid. And number one is taxes. Now before you go out and stop paying taxes, let me clarify what I mean here because as an attorney who is not your attorney, there are certain things that the IRS tax code allows you to do with your money which allow you to legally pay less money in taxes. There's a difference between tax avoiding and tax evading. Tax avoiding is when you're using the IRS tax rule book to do things legally that allow you to pay less money in taxes. Tax evading is illegal and you'll go to jail. The first thing that you have to understand is that the IRS doesn't tax you on how much money you earn they tax you on your taxable income. These are two completely different things because now you take the money that you earn and then you're gonna show all the write-offs and deductions as possible and then that is gonna leave you with your taxable income. So the first question that successful people ask is how can I have more write-offs and more deductions legally. Now there's no way for me to go over all the different ways to do that. I mean the federal income tax code right here is over 2,000 pages long of extremely tiny font. So there's a lot of different information here. The best thing to do is to get a CPA, get an accountant who not only will help you file your taxes but also do tax planning because if all your CPA is doing is filing your taxes, you are leaving a lot of money at the table. Tax planning is now where you work with the CPA, you're working with the accountant to come up with a plan on different things that you can do with your money that we can pay less money in taxes legally. The big thing that I want you to understand here is that the IRS tax code essentially pats you on the back if you create your own income or if you are an investor. So let me explain what this means. If you are a W-2 employee and all you earn income from is the job that you go to, so you get a paycheck for the work that you put in and you are a W-2 employee, then what happens is you make money from your job, you're gonna pay taxes, and this is probably gonna be automatically deducted out of your paycheck, and then you get to spend whatever's left. So now if you want a car, you gotta spend this money after tax dollars. If you want a phone, you gotta spend these after tax dollars. If you wanna go to California, you gotta spend these after tax dollars. If you create your own income, so if you are a business owner, you're a 1099 worker, now you're creating your own income, now it's a little bit different. So I'll call this your own income. Now you're gonna make money, whether it's from your business or your 1099 income, and then you get to spend this money because now you can have qualified business expenses. These are called ordinary and necessary expenses where now you could tell the IRS, hey, I need a cell phone to run my business. I need a laptop to run my business. I need a car for my business. I need to go to California to meet with some people for my business. Now you get to spend money here and then you pay taxes on whatever's left. That means you have a smaller taxable income because you paid the expenses first. Now, not everything is gonna qualify as an expense, but you have to show that it's ordinary and necessary, and this is where a good accountant can help with that. That means if both of these two people were to earn the same amount of money, if both of these people both earned $100,000, they get to keep different amounts of money after their taxes 
because, well, that's what the IRS tax code allows. The second thing that I want you to understand about the tax code is that all income is not treated the same. Like what I said earlier, the IRS pats you on the back if you create your own income or if you're an investor, well, you'll see that here. There are three general categories of income according to the IRS tax code. You have ordinary income, this is the money you make from your job, your W-2 income. You have your portfolio income, this is essentially your investment income. If you buy a stock and sell it for a profit two years later, that's considered portfolio income. And then you have passive income. This is the income you make from a business that you passively own. This could be something like real estate rental income. Do you wanna know which taxable income has the highest tax rate and the lowest amount of tax deductions that you can take? Take a guess. Well, this one right here, the money you make from your job. You're gonna pay the highest tax rates here and you get the lowest deductions. As you can see from the previous example, you get more deductions when you create your own income and those are things that you could potentially qualify here under your passive income because when you own real estate rental properties, you can have that benefit of filing a bunch of different expenses that are a part that are ordinary and necessary for your real estate business and then your portfolio income, this is the money you make from your stock market investments that you sell for a profit after a year of owning them. Well, with these investments, you get a lower tax rate. The top tax rate with portfolio income is right around 20%. The top tax rate when it comes to your ordinary income is about double that. I don't wanna to go too deep into tax strategies in this video because I've made other videos where I explain that. So if you wanna learn more about different tax strategies that you can use, I'll link a video that you can watch down in the description below. The second thing that wealthy people avoid are payments, especially on things that aren't making them any money. We live in this kind of fast food microwave culture where when we want something, we want it now. We don't wanna put in the work to actually be able to afford it. We just feel like we deserve it, so we should buy it now. And now with the help of all the financing available, buy now, pay later, credit cards, easy financing, 0% APR, it is easier than ever for people to qualify for things that they can't afford. Just because you can buy something doesn't mean that you can afford it. And now what are we doing? Well, we're justifying liabilities as assets. An asset is something that puts money in your pocket. A liability is something that takes money out of your pocket. So now when you go out and you buy your clothes, your shoes, your vacations, or even your car, these are liabilities that are pulling money out of your pocket. Now, when you go out and you finance these liabilities, when you go and finance your clothes, you go and finance your shoes, you go and finance that Gucci, or you go and finance that car, you're paying interest on something that is losing value. The average new car payment at the time of me recording this video is $717 a month. That doesn't include the insurance, that doesn't include the maintenance on your new BMW, that's just the new car payment. Now, if instead of taking this new car payment and using it to buy a car that's losing value, you took this $717 a month and you just put it into the stock market. You put it into an ETF, an exchange traded fund that is giving you exposure to the total stock market or the S&P 500. You just put your money into there. Now, historically, we have seen a seven to 10% growth in the stock market a year over the long term. Does that mean that the stock market always goes up? No, but historically we've seen seven to 10%. Let's assume you can get a 7% return on this money. You did this for 45 years. So now you start when you're 21 and do this until you retire. Well now, instead of owning a car that's worth less than what you bought it for, you're gonna have an investment account that's worth over $2.6 million. Because what happens now is you are working to grow this money. When you're taking this money to buy a car, well, what happens is you're gonna to continue to pay off this car. As soon as you pay off the car, it's gonna feel really weird because you don't have any car payments. So now you're gonna trade it in and start the payment scheme all over again. And now you might be saying, but Jasprit, I need a car to get to and from work. Yes, you need a car. We just want a BMW. Instead of having the $717 monthly car payment, which is the average car payment in America, how about you go and buy a $5,000 car or $8,000 car with cash? Now, you don't have to worry about any payments. Yeah, you might have to downgrade from your BMW to a Toyota Camry, but now at least you'll have a decent, good working condition car you won't have to worry about the payments and you can work on taking this money and investing it that we can work to build your wealth before you make everybody else around you rich. When you are financing things that aren't putting money in your pocket, you're paying interest to buy something that's losing money. It's a double whammy. You're paying the bank and you're also losing money. The third thing that successful people avoid are time wasters. See, each one of us have two currencies in our life. The first currency is money, 
but the second currency is time. We've all heard people say that it takes money to make money, and that's a complete lie. It takes money to grow your money, but you don't need money to make money. You need one of these two currencies if you want to make money or both. If you don't have money, then you got to sacrifice your time to make more money. That means you got to use your time to learn how to make more money and you got to use your time in a way that's creative, that way you can earn more money. Once you can earn more money from your time, well then you have more money that you can work to grow by investing this money. But right now, you got to focus on increasing the value out of the time that you have. Each one of us have 24 hours in a day. What are you doing in your 24 hours that will allow you to get the most output out of your 24 hours? If you're scrolling on TikTok all day and all you see on TikTok are people dancing and cat videos, how much value is that really adding to your life? But now if you're scrolling through TikTok and you're seeing financial videos, you're seeing entrepreneurial tips, you're seeing business tips, now you're getting a completely different value out of your TikTok. My friend Tom Bill, you talked about this, where he has trained his TikTok algorithms to show him things that are providing him with value. So when he's going through TikTok, he's not going there to waste time, he's going there to learn. You have to train the algorithms in your life to give you the best return on your time. What I like to say is the best ROI, return on investment, that the average American can make is canceling their Netflix subscription. And it's not because you'll save an extra $10 to $15 a month, it's because you're gonna save two hours a day. If you're spending every evening binging a couple Netflix shows, watching a Netflix movie, that is time that is being thrown away. That's not adding any value to your life. Instead of watching those Netflix shows, how about you go and watch some YouTube videos on financial education? How about you read some books? How about you work on a business idea? How about you start a side hustle idea? How about you learn something that can increase your income? How about you learn about how to invest your money? Now, if you do that for six months, I guarantee you are going to learn so much more than you would have if you continued with the Netflix subscription. So now, it's what are you doing with this time that way now you can actually do something to increase your income and increase how you grow your money. If you do that, you will be in a completely different place in six months, in 12 months, and 18 months, but it requires you to make a sacrifice. The fourth thing that all successful people avoid is overspending. And I kind of hinted at this a second ago, but there's a difference between a need and a want. You need a car, you just want a BMW. You need clothes, you just want the Gucci. You need a home to live in, you just want a mansion. There's a difference between something that we need to buy and something that we want to buy. And what we end up doing is we justify our needs as wants. That way we can go out and spend money we don't have on something we don't really need. But if you're really working to build your wealth, you can't keep spending your money because that means you have less money to invest in yourself. And this could be in your own education. This could be into the stock market. This could be into the real estate market. This could be into business. This could be into something else where you want to put this money that will actually grow. Your Gucci isn't going to make you any money, but your business idea can. Your BMW isn't going to make you rich, but your investments might. And this is where you have to flip the script and stop overspending on the things that aren't making you any money. That way you can overspend on the things that will make you money. Overspend right now on your investments. That way you can spend whatever you want on the liabilities. That way you can spend whatever you want on the cars, the trips, the vacations, and everything else when you can afford it. And the way that you can do that right now is by following like my simple rule of five, which says, if you cannot buy five of them, you cannot afford one of them. This is a simple rule of thumb that you can start using that when, uh, before you go to the store and buy the $100 pair of shoes when you only have $100 in your account, you know that just because you can buy something, you can't afford it. This is where now you have to understand that there's a difference between being able to afford and being able to buy. And what will help you get there is by differentiating needs versus wants. Number five, avoid toxic things. We are products of our environment. And if your environment right now is toxic, if everybody is bringing you down, if everybody's trying to get you to spend money on things that you don't want to spend money on, if everyone's trying to get you to go into debt, if everyone's making fun of you for you trying to work on your financial future, if everybody is really draining you emotionally, you got to find a different environment for you to live in and to thrive in. Now, you might not be able to go and find a whole new group of friends right away, but now you can find digital groups to hang out with. Find YouTube communities, find Discord channels, find different places where you can hang out online that we can make friends and network with people who have a similar mindset as you. Because when you start your financial education journey, everyone's gonna think you lost your mind. When you stop spending money with everybody else, when you stop going to the club, when you stop partying, when you stop traveling and you start spending money on yourself, people will not understand. and They'll tell you that you changed and they won't like it. But you are trying to grow. You're trying to achieve something that you've never had. You're trying to give your family something that they've never had. 
And that's going to require you to make sacrifices and make change. And if everybody's trying to bring you down or if people are draining you emotionally, if you are in a bad relationship, if you're in a place where people are really bringing you down, you have to find a way to get out of that toxic environment. The sixth thing that wealthy people avoid is they avoid letting their short-term desires get in the way of their long-term wants. The best example of this was a story or something that I read years ago when I was trying to get in shape was somebody was talking about how when you want to eat that chocolate bar or you want to eat the bag of chips, you want to eat something unhealthy, tell yourself this that you've been wanting this bag of chips for 15 minutes, but you've been wanting the six pack for 15 years. So don't let that thing that you've been wanting for 15 minutes overcome what you've been wanting for 15 years. And this is really developing the long-term mindset. And this is especially important when it comes to your money, because when you're investing your money to build wealth, you're investing for the long-term. And the biggest criticism that I hear when people talk about investing their money to become wealthy is, I don't want to wait 10, 20, 30, 40 years until I'm wealthy. I want to enjoy my money today. So YOLO, let me go out and spend my money, go into debt and enjoy my life today. Well, guess what? 10 years from now, that time is going to go by. And if you haven't started putting the plan into action, you're going to be older and in a deeper financial hole. 20 years from now, you're going to be even older and in an even bigger financial hole. So you need to start preparing today. That way, when you do get older, that you can be more wealthy. But this requires you to stop being so focused on that short-term gratification and start focusing on the long-term gratification, working for something bigger than you, working for something bigger over in the future. And finally, the seventh thing that successful people avoid are distractions. When you're trying to get in shape, the best thing that I say is out of sight, out of mind. If you want to get in shape, get the cookies out of the house, get the brownies out of the house. Now, when it's not there, you can't eat this stuff. Just like that when it comes to your finances, you gotta get the distractions out of mind. This is why I say cancel the Netflix subscription. Even if it's for six months, that way now you're forcing yourself to do something that's a little bit more productive. You're forcing yourself to go and read, you're forcing yourself to go and watch YouTube videos, educational videos, that way now you can work and start investing in your own education. You have to get away from the distractions. If your friends are constantly making you spend money on things that you don't wanna spend money on, stop hanging out with your friends, at least for a little while. That way you can get your finances in order. If your parents are always making you feel bad for the car that you're driving, don't go and see your parents for a while. Talk to them on the phone. Do whatever you gotta do to get out of those distractions for a little while. That way you can get yourself in order or at least so you can build your confidence. That way now you can be confident in what you're doing for your finances because you know you're working for something bigger. And if everybody is draining of your energy, if everybody's draining you of your drive and your momentum, you gotta get away from that stuff, get away from the distractions, stop spending money on the things that aren't adding any value to your life. That way you can start working on your own life and build that confidence. That way you know that you're gonna build your wealth and nobody else can bring you down from that. If you want to be a successful investor, there are 10 mindset traits that every successful investor has that I'm gonna go over in this video. And number one, if you wanna be a successful investor, being avoiding the shiny object syndrome. Now, when I say shiny object syndrome, I don't mean now you take your money and you go out and buy fancy cars and nice things because that's the attractive thing to do. I'm talking about the attractive investments because now when you have $5,000, $10,000 put aside, you can go out and invest at the slow and steady place, which is more likely to give you a long-term return. And you know that, but you see that nice meme stock or you hear of that new cryptocurrency that's about to blow up or hear this new investment opportunity that nobody knows about that is on the verge, the cutting edge of being able to 10x your money almost overnight, about a year. So it's not a get rich quick scheme. It's like a 12 month game plan, but you can take your $5,000 and turn it into 50 grand by this time next year. I mean, that's, you have to work a whole 12 months to earn that much money. You can just put this money in double how much money you're making by putting this money into this, not a get rich quick investment, but a get rich almost quick investment. But what ends up happening to most people who start chasing these types of shiny investments are, well, you end up paying the price. And they go through these bubbles where the early people who get into these types of amazing opportunities, you might be able to get in, be a testimonial and get out quickly. But it's almost like a drug where when you start to make that money, you don't want to get out. And so now you want to go in even deeper. You make some money and then you put it all back in there, maybe even more. And you start telling your friends about how much money you're making. And then that's when they come in and it keeps growing until ultimately this investment, which was poised to make everybody so rich, 
starts to implode because it didn't have any real value to begin with. There is a lot of value in being a long-term investor. It's not the most attractive thing to do, but there's a reason why over the long term, the successful investors are not the ones that see this overnight success. It's the ones that have worked to build a long-term sustainable portfolio. They say the faster it comes, the faster it goes because, well, if you don't have to go through the work and pain to earn it, you're not going to know how to keep it either. The second thing every successful investor does is they invest in their mind. And this is where I want you to understand the difference between the price you paid, the cost, and the value that you receive. And there's a lot of different examples of this, of price versus cost. But this is where now you have to understand what is valuable to you. And I remember this example because when I was getting started in real estate, I got my real estate salesperson's license and began working for a company called Keller Williams. And then the broker that I was working with told me that she was hosting this seminar on real estate investing. And because I was in her office, she was going to give me a free ticket. I said, okay, cool. I go there and somebody was pitching a class. It was $3,500, I believe, on how to wholesale real estate. I had no idea what wholesaling real estate was. It seemed like a super attractive thing, especially for me getting started in real estate and trying to understand the whole game. And so that was a lot of money for me then. I mean, it's still a lot of money today, but it was a lot of money for me then. But I went out and I spent that $3,500. Now, this is where I know a lot of people, because I talked to a lot of people about this back then, got hung up on the $3,500. Why would I want to spend $3,500 on this class? Education should be free. That's way too much money. It's just making them rich, right? We're focused on the price. We're focused on the cost as opposed to what's the value that I'm going to get. Well, I spent that money on the class and I knew that I wanted to do something with it and I went through it. And well, after month one, I didn't make my money back. I made no money. After month two, I didn't make any money back. I actually still hadn't made any money. Month three, that was when I also didn't make any money. But then in month four, I also made $0 from that class. It wasn't until month five that I actually made any money from this program. And in month five, I made, I think it was about $10,000 off of my first sale, which more than paid for the $3,500 that I had to spend. Now, it took a lot of work and effort on my part but I had to spend money in order to get it. The value to me was way more than the cost that I had to pay. And then I also closed a lot of deals after that. But it took me an investment on my part. Now, I'm not saying go out and just throw your money around and just buy any class, every program, every coaching thing out there, no matter how much the price is. But you have to now look at the value that you receive. If you buy based off of value, as opposed to price. It's a completely different way of analyzing things. I see this in almost anything. When I go to somewhere far, if I got to go to Europe, if I got to go to India, I, growing up, I used to say, I used to go to India pretty often. And I used to have to sit in the back economy, sit like a sardine and flying to India from the United States is like a 20 hour journey. When you sit in an economy, it is very uncomfortable. You can't sleep in those 20 hours because there's somebody to your left, somebody to your right. Somebody's always rolling over. The lights are always turning on. Somebody's always annoying you. There's just a bunch of things happening and you got to sit like this. It's not comfortable. It sucks. But then if you want to go to business class, you're going to pay three to six, maybe seven times more money to have a room essentially this area where you can have a reclining seat you can lay down the food is nicer the service is nicer it's way more peaceful it's way more comfortable and you can sleep comfortably now again both economy and business class are going to take you to where you got to go one's just a whole lot more comfortable and that value of that comfort is valuable to me which is why i am willing and I do pay for that added price. Now, I don't always buy first class tickets. If I'm going on a short domestic flight, yeah, you bet. I'm going to sit in the back if it's cheaper. But if that value is worthwhile to me, I will pay for it depending on what it is. And this is where you have to figure out what value is important to you. I have spent a lot of money on education, a ton of money on financial education and business education and business consultants. Some of it paid off. Some of it didn't. That's kind of the way life works. And this is where now you got to figure out what is valuable to you and 
If something is valuable to you, be willing to spend money on that. For me, if I'm flying long distances, business class tickets are valuable to me. For me, business education is valuable to me, so I pay money for that. Sometimes it works, sometimes I didn't. I had spent over $100,000 on consultants for a blog that I was working to build. And that's just the consulting fee. I also spent probably, I don't know how much, but at least another six figures on writers and editors and softwares and all this other stuff to build this blog. And guess what? It was a complete flop. I lost everything in that investment. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And this is where now understanding, okay, what is valuable to you? Be willing to spend money on things that are valuable to you but also make sure that you have the ability to spend on it, right? But just, just because financial education is valuable to you doesn't mean that you should go into credit card debt to buy expensive programs if you're never going to do anything with it. So you got to be honest with yourself, but look at what's valuable, find the value, and if the value exceeds the price that you have to pay, this might be something you want to consider buying. Number three is you got to be a long-term investor. And this is one of those things that is so difficult for people, especially who are getting started with investing to wrap their heads around is because they think, I'm going to put my money into this thing today and I'm going to monitor the heck out of my stock market portfolio every single day that will hopefully, I'm going to be able to make a lot of money. But if you really want to build wealth, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in six months. It's not even going to happen in six years. It is a long-term game. And this is where you got to just stay consistent. And this is one of those things where Building wealth is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And you can amplify how fast you can become wealthy. But the way you amplify it is by putting more fuel in the fire, meaning earning more money and putting more money into your investments. If you can work to earn more money, well, now you can go and buy more investments and build that wealth much sooner, build the cash flow much sooner, build the investment portfolio much sooner. But you have to be understanding that it takes time to build these investments. It is not something that happens in six months or even six years. This is a long-term game if you really want to get the rewards of being an investor. Number four is you ignore the traditional media. Look, I'm going to be a little bit honest here because I work in the media space, and most traditional media is in the business of selling hype and emotion. It's like TMZ. Why is TMZ so popular? All they do is try to get people angry or get people's emotions and doing a bunch of crazy things. People love watching people's emotions. You're attracted to that. Now, when you go into other news, like the financial news, it's a more sophisticated version of that. People love the drama. That's what draws the clicks. And I'm going to tell you very honestly here, YouTube works the same way. YouTube works on emotion. That's why you see a lot of titles and thumbnails that have to be a little bit clickbaity because if they're not... I'm going to be honest with you, it's going to end up in the YouTube graveyard. It sucks, but that's the way that it works. Now, that's one of the reasons I also have been working so hard to build Market Briefs, which is my daily financial newsletter, because it allows me and my team to distribute the financial news without the sensationalism, without the clickbaitiness, because all the news is in one email. And so now we don't have to go out and put out this clickbaity stuff, because once you open the email... Everything is there and we can provide all the unbiased information without all the emotion. But the reason why I'm saying this is now if you are working to understand what's going on in the financial markets, it's very easy to be drawn in with the emotions. And if you make decisions based off of headlines, it's going to be a very emotional roller coaster and a financial roller coaster for you. That means when you are investing your money, you got to cut out the emotion and look for the real opportunity because Most of the time, things are never as good as the media makes it seem, and things are never as bad as the media makes it seem. It's somewhere in the middle, and it's your job to figure out where that is. Now, if you want to actually figure that out, this is where you want to be digging into the raw data, reading unbiased news sources, and creating your own education yourself. That's my goal with Market Briefs. It's a free financial newsletter that you can read. It's a simple email that you can read in less than five minutes every morning. And if you want to join Market Briefs, I got the link to how you can join down in the description below. Number five is you got to value your time. This one was very difficult for me because growing up, I was kind of cheap and I never really wanted to spend money on anything. And until I started valuing my time, it was very difficult for me to spend my money on certain things. I'll give you an example. When I started investing in real estate, 
I knew I didn't want to be involved in managing my properties because the books that I read talked about in order to scale real estate, you need a team of people. That way you are not a property manager, you are a property investor. And that was the first time I really made that decision to value my time because I knew my goal was to own a real estate portfolio. And I already knew that there was no way that I could drive out to each house and talk to every tenant and do everything. It just seemed like way too much work because I was also in school when I started investing in real estate. So I went out and I hired a property manager. Now, when you're just starting off in real estate, you don't have a lot of negotiating power with a property manager. So you're going to pay close to 10% of a gross rental income to your property manager. If you rent out a property for $600, that's $60 a month. If you're renting it out for $1,000, that's $100 a month. If you're renting it out for $2,000 a month, that's $200 a month in management fees, which it's a pretty big chunk of your revenue right off of the top. But I knew that my time, that was the first time I valued my time. And I knew that my time was worth more than that because if I got sucked into the game of just managing tenants, there was no way that I was going to be able to earn money anywhere else. And this is a big thing that I see with other, especially newer real estate investors, but it's not just new ones. You see experienced real estate investors with 30 units doing the exact same thing where it's the same argument. I don't want to have to pay another person to do what I can do myself. And sure, you can manage your properties yourself. You can do a lot of things yourself, but there's only 24 hours in a day. And what do you want to spend your time doing? You're paying somebody to free your time up. You could do the same thing with having somebody go out and get your groceries, having somebody cook your meals for you, having somebody wash your clothes for you, clean your house for you, mow your lawn for you. There's a lot of different ways that you can buy your time back. And if the price you have to pay is lower than what your time is worth, then it's going to be beneficial for you now to pay somebody to do something instead of you. Now, there is a balance to this because if, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you're trying to build your own business in the beginning, you're probably going to be doing everything yourself for one, because you need to know how the business works. And number two, you got to keep that cash in your business because keeping the cash in your business right now is the most valuable thing. But as you grow, you got to start valuing your time and know when it's right to pay somebody else to do something for you. Number six is don't chase an investment. And this is probably one of the hardest lessons to learn unless you make the mistake yourself and don't chase an investment means when you see a stock or any asset on the news growing quickly, you get excited and you say, Oh, I want to get in too. You might hear of the newest tech companies, the newest AI companies, the newest whatever companies that have been booming. And you don't want to miss out on the fun. And the common story amongst every time this happens is this stock or whatever asset has gone up by 50%. It's gone up by a lot. And every expert that comes onto the financial news says that there's so much more room for this thing to run. There's so much more upside. This is just the beginning. It's going to get so much better. And then now you get excited and you think, maybe I don't, I don't want to come in too late, but then you see the stock go up by another 10% and you say, you know what? Yeah, this is it. I, I want to get in. This is going to go up so much higher. I'm going to get in. Now you come in and you start buying. And in the short term, you might see your investment go up even more. But then what ends up happening a lot of times is two months go by and some bad news comes out. This company says we've been growing a little bit too big or we need to do layoffs or demand has started to slow down or cool off a little bit or technologies are changing or the company gets sued. All these things happen all the time. And then you see all of a sudden the stock drop by 35% almost overnight. Now the people that got in early before all the media hype, they're still up huge. But the people that were chasing who missed the early opportunity are now down. And this is where now when you buy with emotions, you're also much more likely to sell. Maybe if you held on, you might see big gains in the next five years, maybe 10 years, maybe not. But this is where now understanding why are you buying? If you're just trying to chase a rally, you're probably too late. Now, if you're buying it for the long term, that's a different story. But when you're trying to chase Many times you're going to end up losing. Number seven, one person's pain is another person's opportunity. And I'm going to be very blunt with this because this is the reality of how our economic system works. When one person has to sell an investment at a huge loss, that means you can come in and buy it at a huge profit opportunity. 
when the 2008 crash happened, people were getting foreclosed on left and right. Now, it wasn't the investors who told people to go out and buy homes they couldn't afford, to go out and take adjustable rate mortgages, to go out and do subprime mortgages, to tell the bankers to go out and do these sketchy loans, to issue loans, to do all these things. But it happened. And then people were getting foreclosed on. And when people got foreclosed on, the banks got overflooded with foreclosure properties. And then the banks had to start liquidating these foreclosure properties. And then investors were able to come in and buy these investments, these rental properties, these, these homes for pennies on the dollar. Why? Ultimately, because people made bad decisions. Banks made bad decisions. Bad things happened, which created good opportunities for investors. It happens all the time in multiple asset classes. When you see the stock market fall, well, many times when you see a big crash, that means that people had to oversell off because they had overbought. When people think that nothing can go wrong, they will buy with money that they can't afford to lose, maybe even use debt to buy investments. And then when things go down and they get underwatered, now you can see overselling. And when you see overselling, that creates an even bigger buying opportunity. This is... Unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, the way that investing works. Somebody has to sell something that somebody is going to buy. And your job as an investor is to be able to buy good investments at a good price. And a good price means, well, if you can buy it at a discount, even better for you. You want to look for the opportunities. And that means, number one, you have to be prepared. Number two, you have to be financially educated. And then number three, you have to be willing to take the opportunity when it comes your way because the reality is somebody else's dumb mistake can be your great opportunity. Number eight is if it's too good to be true, it probably is. And there's no good way for me to explain this. But you know that feeling that you get in your gut? Everybody talks about this. It's hard to really quantify and qualify what that feeling is. But when it feels like something's off on a deal, it probably is. And trust your gut's instinct on this. If the person seems like everything is too perfect, if the asset seems like everything is just too rosy, everything is too nice, it probably is. And this is where understanding that when people are desperate to sell something, they'll be much more likely to cover up the blemishes. So understand that. If something seems too perfect, too good, Use your gut instinct and either do more research or potentially consider walking away because sometimes those can be either the get-rich-quick schemes that talk about how nothing bad can go wrong or it could be an investment that's on the verge of imploding. And this is where you got to be able to differentiate the investment that's selling for a huge discount and the investment that someone's just trying to get rid of before the thing implodes. Number nine is understanding your worst investments because for most successful investors, their worst investment wasn't something that went down, wasn't something that they lost money on. It was a missed opportunity. It was a great investment opportunity that they didn't take. Now, you don't always know what a good investment opportunity is. Hindsight is 2020. But that, for pretty much everybody, is going to be their worst investment, is making the lost investment. This is where now looking through your investment opportunities and understanding that sometimes the ones that you can pretty much think are a guaranteed win are the ones that will lose. And the ones that you will never in a million years think will succeed are the ones that win. And the really successful investors are the ones that are able to kind of cut through all the noise, go through all the fancy stuff and find the real investment opportunity and stick with it for the long term. Now, again, hindsight is twenty twenty. You're never going to know until it happens. But understanding that sometimes the best investments are covered up with the most crap. And finally, number 10 is there will be another once in a lifetime opportunity. And this goes back to not being emotional. Because when you go through now your investment journey and you start finding investment opportunities, you're going to see some opportunities that you feel like are amazing. The stock, I cannot believe how low it's trading. This is going to be a great opportunity. Should I go into debt to buy it? Or maybe it's a real estate deal. This is an amazing property in an area where everything is developing and you cannot believe that this property is for sale. And you feel like this right here is a once in a lifetime opportunity. But if you're not ready to buy it, don't invest on emotion. 
because there will be another once in a lifetime opportunity. There is never just one once in a lifetime opportunity, which is why you don't want to get emotional with their investments. If something is not adding up, if the numbers are not making sense, if something is not clear in the deal, don't go in and buy it just because you think that there will never be another opportunity like this again. There will be. There will be another once in a lifetime opportunity. So don't go out and do something that is against your investment goals and your investment strategy just because you think that this is the only time that you're ever going to see a deal like this. Whew, that was a lot. What are some other mindset traits that every successful investor has? Let me know down in the comments below. Unlike what the majority of people think, asking for a raise is not the best way to get rich. I'll show you. In a business, there are three ways that you can get paid. You can get paid from your salary, you can get paid from profits, or you can get paid from equity, invisible money. To diagram this out, let's assume that you work for a company that's owned by five different people. And let's assume that this company makes a million dollars a year in revenue. If we assume that it costs $300,000 to run the business, not looking at salaries, but other expenses, things like your rent, your operating costs, your materials costs, and your advertising costs, that leaves $700,000 in the business. But then the business has to pay for salaries, has to pay for your salary. Let's assume that $200,000 are salaries, out of which $50,000 goes to you, the other $150,000 goes to the other employees. So now, you got $50,000. This is your guaranteed income. This is your salary. But there's $500,000 left in the business. This is the profit, and then you also have the invisible equity. Starting with the profit, the $500,000 in profit is controlled by the five owners. That's $100,000 each for each owner, and then they can decide if they want to take that money out and spend it, or if they want to take that $500,000 and reinvest it back into the company to grow it from $1 million in revenue to $2 million. But then you also have this invisible money thing that I've been talking about, the equity, which is the valuation of the company which is how much is this company worth? Now, there's no exact number for this because it's kind of a, a made-up number, but it can have real implications because what investors will try to do is value their company based off of a multiple of profits, meaning if this company is making $500,000 a year, maybe the company is worth eight times profits. So if you take eight, multiply it by the profit, $500,000, that means this company is worth $4 million. Who does that go to? Again, the owners of the company. So now let's assume that the business grows. Their business revenue grows to $2 million. Maybe the expenses grow as well. Let's assume the expenses grow to $500,000 and the company's salaries grow as well. Now the company has to pay half a million dollars a year in salary costs and you got a raise. Now you go from $50,000 a year to $75,000 a year. You're happy because now you're making more money. But now the company is making a million dollars a year in profits. Now, who do these profits go to? Again, the profits are distributed to the owners. They can decide if they want to pull this money out and spend it themselves or if they want to reinvest this money back into the company and grow it to $4 million in revenue. But what about the invisible money, the equity? If we still follow the eight times multiple, that means now you take the profit, the $1 million, multiply it by eight, and now this company is worth $8 million. Who gets that? Again, the owners. You got a raise. You're making some more money, which is nice. But the real wealth is given to the owners, not the workers. Now, at this point, I already know what you're thinking. You're getting ready to type me something like, Jaspreet, that's cool and all, but I'm not an entrepreneur. I don't want to start a business. I don't know what else you want me to do. That's not for everybody. And that's fine. I'm not saying you need to go out and start a business. But what I'm saying is you have to understand how this business works that we can understand how to actually get rich. Because see, we live in what's called a capitalist system. In a capitalist system, there are two ways you can get paid. You can get paid from your labor, which is what you do when you get a salary, or you can get paid from your capital, which is what the owners get. Because now when you get paid as an owner, you get the profit and you get that invisible money, that equity. But the thing you need to understand about this is in a capitalist system, the best way to get paid is through your capital. That's where the real wealth is built, not through your salary. Because what happens with your salary is you have less risk. Right? With your salary, you're going to get a paycheck every two weeks, maybe every week. You're getting paid no matter what. Whether the company profit goes up or down, you're getting paid. So you kind of have that lower risk because, well, you know how the paychecks work. With the profits, you have more risk. You don't know if the company is going to make money. Maybe this company goes bankrupt, which means you lose your salary as well. But maybe that means the company will make smaller profits. Maybe it makes bigger profits. So you don't know where the profit is going to be. However, if you take the risk to own those profits, you also get the benefit 
of the invisible money, the equity. So the wealth in America and first world countries is built through the equity and through the profits. But most people want to just get rich through bigger salaries. And then what do they do with that salary? They use the salary to live a bigger life. We want to make more money so we can have nicer things. But if you really want to build wealth, you got to flip that around. You want to make money so you can own the equity. You want to make money so you can own the profits. You don't have to go out and start a company. In fact, most people should not go out and operate a company. Most people should not go out and start a company. However, in America, everybody, every single person needs to be a business owner. How do you do that? You take the money that you're earning, and now you got to own the businesses through a piece of the money that you're earning. Take some of the money that you're earning and use it to buy investments, use it to buy assets. If you use your money, some of your money, and you take it to the stock market, and you buy a share of, say, McDonald's, you become one of the owners of McDonald's. That means now, as McDonald's makes bigger profits, you make more money. If McDonald's has bigger profits, you also see more equity. Now, how does that work? Well, McDonald's pays out what's called a dividend. A dividend is a distribution of profits. That means if you own one of the shares of McDonald's, you get paid every three months for doing nothing except owning the stock. Now, it's not a ton of money if you own just one share, but it's better than nothing. And if McDonald's makes bigger profits, they generally pay out bigger distribution checks. And then if the valuation of McDonald's grows, that means the stock price also grows. And this is where now that real wealth is built. Wealth is built through owning assets, not just through your salary. But the thing you want to understand here is when is a raise beneficial? See, most people use a raise to upgrade the lifestyle. They use a raise to inflate the lifestyle. They use a raise to buy nicer things. But you want to use your raise to buy more assets because that's where the real wealth is built. But now, why are most people not doing this? Because it's hard and because it takes a long time, and because it takes dedication, and because it takes sacrifice. See, wealth through owning assets takes time unless somebody just hands you a million dollars. Most of us don't have that, which means now you're going to have to slowly work to buy assets, which means it might take you a decade of slowly accumulating to buy assets to see some significant increase in your wealth, to have an increase and in a new stream of income from your investments. Most people don't have the patience or the diligence or the dedication to do that. But if you do that, I call it a decade of sacrifice, you're going to have the ability to have a whole new stream of income, to have a whole new stream of wealth built through money that you're not working hard to earn, through money that your money's working to earn. And that's where the wealth is built. And this is where we're now understanding how do you use your income in a way that's going to make you wealthier instead of making everybody else rich? That's the key to becoming wealthy. And if you want step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this, my team at Briefs Media has a free ebook on how to build wealth as an investor that you can download for free that walks you through how to use your money, how do you buy assets, what are assets that you can buy, what are the different ways you can get paid, how do you generate cash flow, how do you protect your assets. This ebook is completely free. And if you want to get a copy of this ebook, I'll put the link to how you can download this ebook down in the description below, or you can go to briefs.co slash ebook. But the crazy thing is, most of us are never taught how this works. We're taught to get paid, get a bigger paycheck, and then spend our paycheck. But that's not how wealth is built. And that's the thing that I want you to understand. If you can understand one thing from this video, it's that true wealth is built through owning assets. It's not through your salary. And it doesn't matter how much money you're making. It doesn't matter if you're a doctor. It doesn't matter if you're an NBA player. You can make millions of dollars a year from your salary. But as soon as you stop working, that income stops coming in. Then what? Maybe you have a big savings account if you were smart enough to save. But that savings is going to drop every time you spend a dollar. And now what? See, that's where you have to have a second stream of income. And that second stream of income can't be from you going to work to get paid if you want to become wealthy. This is what wealthy people want. Wealthy people want that second stream of income, maybe third, maybe fourth, but we'll talk about second right now. They want that second stream of income that pays them even if they're not going to work to get paid. That's where wealth is. And the way you do that is by using some of your money to buy these investments that will pay you just for owning them instead of having to keep working to get paid. Because maybe one day you want to retire. Maybe one day you don't want to work. Maybe you want to take some time off. Maybe you can't work, but you want to keep getting paid because it costs money to eat and it costs money to feed other people. And that's why wealthy people want to get paid from their capital. They want to get paid from their profits. They want to get paid from the equity rather than just the salary. 
We're taught to get paid from our salary. We're taught to ask for big raises. We're taught to ask for a bonus. But we're not taught what to do with that money. But what you do with that money is more important than how much money you're generating. And that's where the wealth is built. It's through what you do with the income. But most of us are never taught this. And that's why if you really want to become wealthy, if you really want to get rich, you got to know what to do with that money. And that means you got to use that money to buy the right assets that will keep paying you instead of using the money to pay somebody else. 2024 is your year to make more money. And what I want to do in this video is go over five different things that you can start doing right now. That way you can make more money in 2024 than you did in 2023. And everything that I'm talking about in this video is based off of what's happening in the economy today because we're seeing a lot of changes happen in 2024. 2024 is an election year. We're seeing the compounding effects of all the inflation. We're going to see the impacts of the higher interest rates. We might see interest rate cuts. So what I want to do today is talk about the different ways that you can earn more money in 2024. And let me start by talking about number one which is capitalize on the political emotion. You might not like what I have to say, but if you're interested in making some more money, this is some harsh reality for you. Election years have become more and more polarizing. You've seen people say, if you don't agree with me, just delete me off your Facebook or your Instagram or whatever. This has become the norm. And so naturally, when people are more emotional about something, they're more likely to change the way they spend on that same thing as well, because when people are emotional, well, they're also likely to open up their wallets. Now, where are people emotional? People are emotional when it comes to politics. People are emotional when it comes to geopolitics. And there's a lot of changes happening in the world, not just with our own elections. You're seeing the war happening in the Middle East. You're seeing things happen out in Ukraine and Russia. So with all these things happen, they create opportunities because people want to, number one, be in the know, even if they don't really know what they're talking about. People want to feel like they're in the know and people want to be a part of something. So this creates opportunity for you. What kind of opportunities can it be? Well, this can be a whole range of things. For example, if you are involved in or you're interested and you like talking about and researching what's going on in the political side of things, you can go out and create a political newsletter. You can go out and create political social media pages, a podcast, or even apparel because people will want to tune in to what's happening in 2024. This is not my space. I'm not a very political person. I don't really follow it that closely. And so that's why everything that I cover is more in the financial space, because that's what I understand. That's my interest. That's my passion. But you see a lot more emotion around the political side of things, especially during election years. And you've been seeing the emotion of these types of things really skyrocket over the last decade. So that creates opportunity for you, because if you can start building an audience or a brand around something that's trendy, people will want to read what you're talking about every single day, because people love keeping up with that stuff. And if you can cater to somebody's emotion, because politics now is becoming more and more emotional, you can keep people hooked and coming back to you, which means you can keep making money day after day after day. The second way that you can make more money in 2024 is to take advantage of where interest rates are. And what I mean by this is our central bank in the United States, the Federal Reserve Bank, has come out and said that they are planning to cut interest rates a few times in 2024. Now, we don't know how many times they're actually going to cut interest rates. We don't know when they're going to cut interest rates. However, even if they cut interest rates a few times in 2024, interest rates would still be relatively high compared to where we were a few years ago. However, that can benefit you if you have some extra cash because that means you can put your money into a place that's generating you some interest. What are those places? Well, the most accessible place would be something like a high interest savings account, which is why if you don't have one yet, please consider getting one. A high interest savings account, especially at something like an online bank or legitimate banks, they're FDIC insured and they are a place where you can keep your money and earn some more interest. At the time of me recording this video, that's something like four to five percent a year in interest on your savings. These are not CDs. Your money is not tied up. You don't have any restrictions on what you can do with your money. You can pull your money out at any time, and this bank is FDIC insured. You don't want to put your money into one of those scammy, sketchy places that are not FDIC insured. Make sure that the bank is FDIC insured if you're going to be keeping your savings there, but at least you can start generating four to five percent a year in interest as opposed to keeping your money in something like Bank of America or Chase Bank, where you're getting 0.05%. So if you have some extra cash, you might want to consider moving some of this money to a high interest savings account. Just make sure, this is your warning and disclaimer, 
Make sure they're a legitimate bank, not a scam. Make sure they're FDIC insured and understand that if you're putting more money in than what is FDIC insured, then you are taking a risk with that. So just understand the risks. Number three is take advantage of investment opportunities. What pretty much every banking institution on Wall Street has talked about is that they are expecting more volatility in 2024. Why? Because there's uncertainty as to what's going to happen with interest rates. There's uncertainty as to what's going to happen with inflation. We've been seeing inflation fall for the last few months. However, if inflation makes a U-turn, then you could see a change in what the Federal Reserve Bank says. You could see a change in what the market predicts. And all these things can create more volatility. But they create opportunities. Just like how I talked about with number one, people have become much more emotional on the political side of things. People are also very emotional on the investment side of things. Now, part of the reason for that is that Stock market investing has become much more accessible, which is great news. There are so many tools and softwares out there which let anybody with $10 start investing their money into the stock market. That's the good news. However, most people have zero financial education when it comes to actually putting their money to work. So what happens? You have a lot of people that are buying high and selling low. You have a lot of people that are buying on emotion, buying on greed, and selling on panic. And this can drive more volatility. However, if you have a little bit more patience, if you invest a little bit more in your financial education, this creates more opportunities for you because when everybody's running away, panicking and screaming, you will be able to find the opportunity. And while we don't know what's going to happen in 2024, if we continue to see volatility, that creates opportunity because that can create more buying opportunities when things are down. Because that also means if interest rates don't go the way the markets expect, that can create more buying opportunities. If inflation doesn't go the way the markets expect, that can create more buying opportunities. If things don't go the way that people or investors expect, that creates buying opportunities. But the only person that can capitalize on that are the people that are, number one, prepared, meaning they have some cash, and number two, are financially educated and savvy enough to be able to capitalize on those opportunities. And there are always investment opportunities in every single market. But you have to be the person that's investing in a financial education and working to build that financial preparedness, and that can create more opportunities for you in 2024. So if you haven't started working on that, this is the time to definitely start doing that because, well, we're going to see impacts of the higher interest rates. We're going to see the impacts of inflation. We're going to see the impacts of all these factors in the economy, and you want to be ready no matter what happens. Again, if you want some additional tools on this and some financial education, we have a free ebook at Briefs Media titled How to Build Wealth as an Investor that walks you through how do you use your money, how do you build the mindset of an investor to how do you actually invest your money, how do you generate cash flow, what are the different assets that you can invest your money in, how do you spend your money and how do you protect your assets? This ebook is completely free. So if you want to get a copy of this ebook and start learning for yourself, I got the link to can download this ebook and start learning down in the description below, or you can go to briefs.co slash ebook. Number four is don't be lazy. And this one's going to sound interesting, but hear me out on this. The Federal Reserve Bank has come out publicly and they have said that they are expecting unemployment to rise in 2024. Why are they expecting unemployment to rise? Because they are expecting the impacts of the higher interest rates to lead to a slowdown in economic growth, a slowdown in job hiring, and a slowdown in employment. This is what the Federal Reserve Bank wants because this is how they're planning to cool down inflation. Now, while that's what's going on in the economic world, what does this mean for you in the job market world? Well, companies are going to become more lean because for unemployment to go up, that means people got to lose their jobs. That means companies got to let people go. And that's not good news if you are lazy and if you want to do the minimum work. I'm not talking to you. But if you're a hustler and you're willing to go the extra mile, this means you're going to have more leverage because you're not just going to have more leverage at your company, but you're going to have more leverage at whatever company you want to work at because companies are now going to become much more picky. We've seen this trend start in 2023, but it's going to continue happening in 2024 where companies are going to want only the best talent. And there's a lot of people out there that are just lazy, that don't want to go the extra mile, that want to work the minimum. And if that's what you want to do, fine, but I'm not speaking to you. For those of you that are hustlers that want to actually put in the work, you are going to have more opportunity to see way more economic growth because companies have less space and bandwidth for the lazy and the crap. Companies are going to want to be more productive. They're going to want to be more efficient. They're going to want to drive more revenue. And if you can be a go-getter, a person that can provide that value that other people are not willing to do for a company, they're going to want you more. 
And if they want you more, they're going to be willing to pay you more. And if your company can't offer that, well, you're going to be able to find other companies that will because companies are going to be much more picky in 2024 because we're starting to see the shift between employee and employer balance. In 2022, the power was in the hand of the employee. You were seeing the great resignation, the quiet quitting, all the things were happening. In 2023, you started to see it kind of balance out a little bit more. But in 2024, expect more power to go into the hand of the employer, which means employee Employers are going to want better talent, and if you can be one of that better talent, you're going to be able to drive better jobs, better income, and a better compensation for you, which means if you're the go-getter, that's more money that can go into your pocket and more opportunities for you as opposed to the people who are not. And the fifth way that you can make more money in 2024 is by investing in a new stream of income. And the reason why this one is important is because we've been seeing this bigger divide between the rich and the poor. And the thing that creates this divide and that really amplifies this divide is inflation. The reason why is because inflation disproportionately benefits the financially educated and it disproportionately hurts the financially uneducated. Why? Because inflation makes consumption more expensive. Inflation means when you go to the grocery store, you got to pay more money. Inflation means when you got to pay a rent, you got to pay more money. Inflation means when you want to buy a vacation, you got to pay more money. That's what inflation is. But who does inflation benefit? It benefits the asset owners. If you are an investor in the grocery store, you're making money. If you're an investor into rental properties, you're making money. If you're an investor into travel companies, you are making money. So who are the people that are investing into these things? It's the financially educated. And that's why when you see inflation happen, you see more asset prices rise, more money goes into the hands of the financially educated, while everybody else who doesn't own as many assets, who just owns cash and savings and your salary, well, all these things lose value. That's why we've been talking about how the cost of living has been growing faster than people's incomes. This has been happening and that will continue to happen. However, the people that are making the money are the people that own the assets, the investors. That's why it is becoming more and more crucial for you to be a financially educated investor and to create a new stream of income. Now, when I say new stream of income, I don't mean you have to go out and create a second job. I mean, you need to start putting your money to work to own assets that will pay you. They can pay you with cash flow or they can pay you with appreciation. That's up to you for how you want to invest. But it is becoming more and more crucial for you to become financially educated because Well, we saw a lot of inflation in 2020. We saw a lot of inflation in 2021. We saw a lot of inflation in 2022. We saw a lot of inflation in 2023. Now the Federal Reserve Bank is hoping we'll get closer to average 2% inflation, but we're still going to see inflation. Remember, they don't want to see 0% inflation. They don't want to see negative inflation to bring the prices back down to where they were in 2019. That's not what they want. They want 2% inflation. That means the prices of things still rise, just not as fast as they were before. But this new price growth that we're going to see in 2024, the inflation that we're going to see in the future is on top of what we saw last year. It's on top of what we saw the year before that. And it's on top of what we saw the year before that. So we're going to continue to see the prices of things rise, maybe not as fast as they were before, but people's incomes haven't been able to keep up and they're not going to be able to keep up because that's not the way the system is designed. So who benefits is the people who are asset owners. And you have the ability now through your financial education to put your money to work. That way you can own the assets. That way you can create a new stream of income through your money, because that's where wealth is built. When you think about wealthy people, how do they build wealth? They built wealth because they built a business. They built wealth because they invested in rental real estate. They built wealth because they invested in stocks. These three things have built more wealth than anything else over the last century. It's not through having a big salary. It's not through paying off your home. Now, having a big salary can help you buy more assets. Having a paid off home can help you have less expenses so you have more money to buy other assets. But the real wealth is built through building a business, investing in stocks, investing in real estate. Once you understand that, that will show you that you need to start using your money differently. And this needs to be the year. If you're not already investing your money. If you're not already having a financial system of putting your money to work, you got to start that now because this divide is going to continue. Whether we see a recession, whether we see economic growth, it does not matter. This is going to continue. And what you want to be doing is investing your money, whether you see a downturn, whether you see an upturn, and just use downturns as an opportunity to invest more aggressively instead of just waiting for the perfect time to invest because then you miss out on all the growth when times are good. 
So if we see economic downturns, if we see a market crash, use that as an opportunity to invest even more, but you want to keep deploying your money. That way you can keep accumulating more and more assets that can keep paying you with an additional stream of income without you having to go to work to get paid. If something happened to the economy, if something happened to your revenue, well, now you don't have the same money to keep living that same lifestyle. And this is where you do not want to start blowing that money. Remember, the goal here is to build wealth. And this is where you got to be smart. Have a system where you know no matter how much money you make, how much money are you allowed to spend, invest, and save. I say follow something like